Thank you everyone for joining this meetup today. We have a very special engineer uh, that's guest speaking at this meetup, so I'm very excited. We mentioned earlier that we have um, we have a lot of car fans, so I am super happy to have an uh, engineer from McLaren team join us today and speak at the meetup. Um, and I'm just gonna give a short introduction of myself. My name is Erez, I work for a company called Noble9 and I've been part of this meetup for over one and a half year, actually almost two years. And I have been really lucky to work with some amazing people in this meetup. Here's my co-organizers. And I wanna give a huge thank you and shout out to all of them for the amazing work and contribution that they have provided in order to make this meetup great for the past one and a half year. And um, we also want to take a moment and say thank you to Jolene Kidney from Get History Team. Jolene has been a part of this uh, meetup planning committee for over, over a year. Jolene is moving on to some other projects and won't be helping us with the meetup anymore. However, we are really grateful and honored to have had a part of the meetup. Um, so Jolene, thank you for the amazing work you have put, on, put into this meetup. And I will just give a short intro of the agenda of, of today. Uh, so we're gonna have Andrew Jarvis from um, McLaren take over and talk in a few minutes. And um, after that, we have a dedicated q &A session with Andrew. So please take note of the questions you have or put them in the chat and then Andrew will make sure to answer them after his, um, after his session is over. After that, we have our founder, Kit Merker, who will be sharing some really exciting news about the meetup. So please stay for that. And by the end, we have decided to have a breakout room. That's a uh, breakout rooms. That's a perfect, um, that's a perfect uh, time for all of us to interact and to socialize with each other. So stay for that too. And if people want to join the main, main session of the breakout rooms to keep asking questions or hang out, then you're welcome to do that. And it's finally time for me to introduce our guest speaker, Andrew Jarvis from um, McLaren Racing Team. Andrew will be speaking today about SRE parallels in motorsports. Andrew, whenever you're ready, please um, let me know and I'll stop sharing. Cool, thank you, Rosa. Let me just share my screen. Cool, can you see that all okay? I assume so. Yes. Cool. All right. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Andrew Jarvis. And yeah, I'll take you through my presentation today, um, which is trying to look at some parallels between um, uh, my area of interest or my, my industry um, in motorsport and SRE. Um, so just onto the agenda. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, what is Formula One? Uh, then we're going to go into uh, looking at monitoring in motorsport and try and draw some parallels between uh, what we're doing uh, and what I see uh, some parallels in SRE. So looking at how it's kind of splits into um, rough things like alerts, tickets and logging. Uh, then we're going to look at my expertise, which is race engineering, uh, looking at how we use uh, raw telemetry coming from the car to try and make decisions. Um, but then also looking at how we use things uh, like metrics and events um, to try and make decisions as well. Uh, and then very briefly at the end, we'll look at the data life cycle um, of how we use uh, data within Formula One. I will say at this point, um, because of the nature of Formula One, it's confidential and competitive. Uh, I can't go into full details of some of the methods that we use. Um, so I kind of wanted to set that bar a little bit low to start. Um, the point of this talk is more to kind of set the scenes of similarities uh, of what we're doing in motorsport to try in the hope of trying to trigger some ideas and cross pollination um, of the techniques that we use in both motorsport and SRE. So um, my name is Andrew Jarvis, a little bit about myself. So I'm the lead performance and operations engineer um, at Aaron McLaren SP, which is the IndyCar team of um, uh, McLaren. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. I spent nine years at McLaren racing. So my first two years I spent in the simulator within vehicle dynamics. Uh, then spent five years on the uh, F1 race team. So two years I was car performance engineer. Uh, I then spent uh, the next three years as um, the driver performance engineer where you work directly with the driver. So for two years, I was with Fernando Alonso. And for one year, I was uh, with Lando Norris during uh, in his rookie year in 2019. Uh, these last two years, I've spent uh, with the ND of Car Race team uh, over, over here in the US. I'm the trackside representative from McLaren. Uh, so basically, I'm trying to bring uh, the operational performance knowledge of the F1 and Indy Car teams uh, closer together. Uh, and the picture here is... Uh, the helmet that Lando gifted me on my final race in Abu Dhabi. And I will say it's one of the most uh, surprising gifts I've ever got, um, but it was uh, quite a cool thing to get. 
Um, so first of all, what is Formula One? Uh, you know, in a sentence, it's the pinnacle of open wheel motorsport. Um, but I always kind of struggle to explain it in full terms, uh, just in words. So what I thought I would do is just show you a video uh, of a lap and talk you through it. Um, so this is a lap from Austria, this is Lando Norris in 2019. For it's the pinnacle of open wheel motorsport. They're the fastest regulated road course cars in the world. Um, we operate across five continents. And 2022, um, there's a plan to do 23 races. So that's record breaking. Um, each team has, uh, there's 10 teams, each with two cars and each operate, each team operates under a budget cap, at least in 2021 of 145 million US dollars. Uh, and each team must produce a car that's in compliance with the FIA technical regulations. So the question really is, you know, in such a high paced research and development sporting environment, how do teams gain a competitive advantage? Uh, and to me, the real answer there is just data. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, and we're going to start by looking at monitoring motorsport and look at some of the parallels between SRE uh, and uh, what we do and split it into alerts, tickets and logging. So the first thing I want to talk about, though, is the kind of data that comes off the car. Um, Sensor, but, um, sensor choice is very much based towards performance uh, given weight trades. You don't want any unwanted sensors on the car. Any kind of weight that's on the car is going to make, make it go slower. Um, so we prioritize things that are going to make us quicker, uh, which is basically grip. So uh, tire monitoring, chassis monitoring, uh, power, uh, so engine and drivetrain monitoring, and downforce, which is uh, you know aerodynamic pressures. Uh, so depending on uh, the session that we're in, whether it's a race, whether it's a test, whether we have extra logging on the car, uh, we tend to have between 250 and 300 sensors on the car uh, with logging frequencies, which are typically between uh, one hertz and one kilohertz. Um, and just to go through in a little bit more detail of the kinds of data that we're getting off the car. So for engine and gearbox, it's uh, speeds, positions, temperatures, pressures. Uh, the driver, which is the thing that I'm um, most involved with, uh, is his inputs, so steering wheel, brake, throttle, uh, the chassis, um, accelerations for the bombs, obviously, and GPS for position. Uh, tires, pressures, temperature, speeds, aerodynamic pressures, as I said before, and then suspension loads and, and displacements. Um, so obviously there's a lot of data coming off the car. Uh, and how do we try and avoid data overload? How do we ensure that the right data is being used at the right time? Uh, and I know that's a, a question very close to your heart, it's an SRE. Uh, and what we do is something similar to what you do is split monitoring tasks roughly in similar areas. So alerts, tickets, and loggings, uh, logging. Um, they're split slightly by functional group, um, and, and I'll go into that now. So in terms of alerts, uh, I would say that most closely relates to race engineering um, in our structure. So race engineering is very much the kind of customer facing branch of our engineering group. Uh, by interacting with our driver, we're using our institutional knowledge um, to give feedback to um, try and improve performance and reliability into the wider uh, engineering organization that develop our product. In our case, the product is obviously the car. Um, you know, the areas that I tend to focus in, just as, as examples of alerts, so lap time loss. You know, lap time is our main metric in Formula One. In whatever form, if we're losing it, whether it's to a teammate, whether it's to competitors, whether it's to ourselves, that needs to be minimized immediately. Um, so that's kind of a form of alert for us. Um, something like wet weather, for instance, as well. You know, if wet weather changing track conditions, you have to immediately react to that to try and help the car uh, deal with that situation. So that's kind of uh, alerts. Uh, tickets, you know, clearly there's too much data to analyze in full time, in full detail in real time. Uh, so what we have are large groups of engineers in mission control, uh, and they run analysis, which are analyses which are a bit less time critical. Uh, and they also pick up ad hoc analysis requests coming from engineers track side. Uh, a good example of this is a simulator. So anytime the car is on track in practice, uh, we're running the simulator back in Woking. Um, and any ad hoc uh, requests from the race engineers uh, say they want to see what mechanical balance change does or an error balance change does, uh, but they don't have time or resource to do it at track, they can send that back to the factory uh, and the simulator, they'll run it. And then eventually, you know, uh, sometime later, they'll come back with that analysis um, um, to give some help. So that's a good example. Uh, simulation correlation, another one, you know, it's important to keep our tools up to uh, as accurate as possible um, and just check the car as, as we expect. So all of those kind of tasks are handled. Um, back at base and working. And then logging, this is more towards kind of controls engineering side of the organization, because um, there are multiple systems involved in just making the car run. You know, it's not possible for team members, again, to monitor that every channel real time, but also it's not necessary even to go back through them in post-processing. So a vast amount of the data, systems data that we use is purely for diagnostic and forensic purposes. Um, 
you know, a good example, maybe gearbox dog position sensors. You know, if everything's working correct, correctly, there's no need to go back and look at it. But as soon as you have a shifting problem, um, you need to understand that and go back and look at it immediately. So that was a very quick look at kind of the monitoring structure and how it has parallels to SRE. Uh, what I want to do now is go into a bit more detail of um, the particular area of the team that I work in, which is race engineering um, and how we visualize data and how we try to prioritize it to make sure we're looking at the right data at the right time. Now, uh, this is a very typical chart that we look at in race engineering. This is like race engineering 101 chart. Uh, and this is telemetry as it comes off the car in its raw form. Um, so this is just to go through the chart in a bit more detail. So we've got gear number at the top. Uh, we've got the steering angle in orange. Um, I should say at this point, actually, this is the same lap that we watched in the video. So, you know, from, from Lando's point of view, that's what his lap looked like. From my point of view, this is what his lap, looked like, look, lap looks like. Um, so we've got the wheel speeds, uh, we've got the brake pressure and the throttle pedal. Um, now there's two main ways that we use uh, raw telemetry, um, for, for kind of from a human perspective. One is pattern recognition from experience and expectation. And the other is compares. So either to another lap or to simulated uh, results. And uh, now I'll talk about the first one, uh, pattern recognition first. So really, you know, the human eye can only take in a finite amount of information at any given time. Um, so what we try and do is prioritize the channels that are gonna give us the most chance of picking up a problem on our main chart, which is this one that I show here. Um, it's a simple example, um, but it's basically what we're trying to do is look at variations from the norm in these channels, and that helps us guide us, you know, what's the biggest uh, lap time loss that we have. And then once we've zoomed in on that, we can start to look in ever more increasing details within the data. So this is a full lap. And just from my experience and pattern recognitions, I can see you know, in turn three, one of the speed wheel speeds is slower than the rest of them. That's automatically a, a big red flag to me. So that says, okay, well, that's probably the biggest lap time loss that I need to start looking at very quickly. So then I'll zoom into turn three. Uh, and as, as you zoom in, you start to see a bit more detail of how the driver's controlling the car. And again, from pattern recognition, just from my experience of having looked at you know, a lot of data, I can see this brake pressure profile is not at all what I'd expect. You don't expect to see this kind of uh, release of brake pressure, reapplication and release again as the wheel's locking and then another reapplication. To me, that's just screaming that there's lap time loss. The things that we don't currently know from this chart though, are A, how much lap time loss, and B, you know, why is he locking? We don't know why he's locked the wheel there. And really my task is to try and figure out why he's locked to make sure that we don't do it again on the next lap, on the next run, on the next day. Um, so why is he locking? The next thing I would do is then go into what I call the branch charts. Um, and this is just an example of one. So I've, uh, all the rest of the channels that were just shown, shown are at the top of the screen. Um, and then I've added slip ratios and push rod loads. I should say these are heavily filtered, so you shouldn't be able to tell too much detail from them. It's just an example. Um, but it might be that we look at slip ratios, you know, are they balanced through stop? How sudden is the lock? Is my brake balance right? Push rod loads, um, is the, the load on the wheel too low? Is it balanced uh, left to right or front to rear? Um, should I change my setup to try and improve that? Um, you know, shift statistics not shown here, but are my shifts right, uh, wind direction, is the driver getting a tailwind, which is pushing them on in the corner? All of these things you've got to try and figure out very quickly and hone in on the one thing that you think is the most likely culprit for that, for that particular um, point of failure, and then start to look in another loop of detail and start going down and down until you find what you think is the most important thing and then try and rectify it for the next time we go through there. Um, it's very important in this situation that your, you know, your charts, your workbook is set up in such a way that you can very quickly look through the data. So the, the, the main chart gives you, um, this is uh, the thing you've got to look at. And then your branch charts are very easily accessible and have the right data and you know exactly where to go very quickly. So that's a, a huge aspect of race engineering, being able to navigate to the right data very quickly. Now, that was the first one, that's pattern recognition. Now the problem with pattern recognition alone is it's difficult to know um, where the reference is. You know, I don't know whether that, that lap, the, um, you know, the, the lockup was actually the fastest way through the corner. I don't know. Um, external influences are changing all the time. Things like uh, ambient track conditions, wind direction, strength, track temperature, traffic. You know, we saw in the lap that he passed two cars. Um, you know, car ahead can have a significant influence in aerodynamics. Uh, we don't know that from uh, just the reference data uh, or from the, um, from the raw data necessarily. Uh, tire condition, you know, 
are we getting more tire day? So it's really hard to know what the ultimate performance is um, and therefore what the size of the laptop, lap time opportunity is. Uh, so what we do is we overlay data a lot in motorsport and that's either to another lap um, or a sim or simulated results. Either can be useful provide, for providing a reference. Um, just to explain the channel on the bottom here, this is probably the most important channel in race engineering. Uh, it gives us a direct measure of our main performance metric, which is lap time um, between two competitors and we call it the time delta. So if it's going upwards, it means that the cyan lap is quicker. And what I should have mentioned is the cyan lap is exactly the same lap um, as we just looked at uh, from the raw data. And then the red lap is a reference lap that I've put in. And if it's going downwards, it means that the red lap is quicker. Now, what I can see, if I'm the cyan driver's um, engineer, I can see turn three, There's a that is by far the biggest lap time loss. And by having an overlay, you can actually start to give a number to it. So you can start to see, oh, we've lost two to three tenths through that corner and, and F1, two to three tenths is massive. Um, so it gives you uh, both where to look and also uh, the size of the, the issue or the size of the problem. Uh, so that's why we use overlays uh, a lot. So similar to the pattern recognition, you can um, zoom in. And now because we've got this reference data, you can start to understand a little bit more about how um, the drive's driving the car and what might have caused the lockup and also the consequences of it. So what you can see here, I've added a, a white line where the lockup starts. And what you can see, if we didn't have the reference data of the red, red lap, you wouldn't necessarily know that he's adding too much steer lock or he's going too quickly. But if you add the reference lap, you can start to see um, actually the lockup is probably caused because he has added uh, steer lock too early and he's not going um, quite as quick. And so you get this kind of uh, initial uh, initiation of the lockup. Um, his reaction to it, you can also tell kind of what happens going forward. So as he releases the brake, you can see that the car, um, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but the car kind of frees up going into the corner, uh, goes uh, quicker, um, but then you can see, because he's gone quicker into the corner, he's starting to actually miss the apex. You can see that he's having to add more steel up late in the corner. And because he's added steel up late in the corner, he's had to delay his, his on throttle. So what we see in the time delta is actually, basically or most of the lap time is lost in exit. So you might say, well, he's losing that time because he's late on throttle. We should look at we should look at why he's late on throttle, or is there something wrong with how he's using the throttle? But actually, if you go back through the corner, the first point of failure is really this this lockup because you can see because he locked up, he went long, and that delayed his throttle. So it's really important looking at the data in this way. You can really dig down into what caused that failure. Um, so that's kind of looking at raw telemetry. If I was to be asked though, so the, the, the problem with the raw telemetry is if my manager came to me and said, you know, what has the understeer level been for the last 20 to 30 laps? As a human, it's very difficult to stare at a single, you know, if I was to stare at the steer angle for 20 to 30 laps as a human, it's very difficult to A, tell where that trend has gone over that period of time, because it's very difficult in terms of your memory of your of what you've seen, um, but also just the, um, time it takes to actually do that. You wouldn't be able to look at anything else in the data. Um, so you'd be pretty much useless. So what we use to try and get around that um, are metrics. And metrics are essentially just a, um, a uh, calculation at a given um, like time period. So for us, it's uh, either every lap, every corner, um, but then uh, you can analyze just this one single value um, at every given time period. Uh, so just to give, uh, and the things that they're really useful for are highlighting trends and also particularly interesting data to investigate. So this is a good example. Uh, what this shows is uh, the balance metric. Uh, the higher it is, the more understeer a car has. Um, and then on the x-axis, it's the lap number. Uh, we've got two drivers on there, the solid driver and the, the dotted driver, so driver one and driver two. Um, so what we can do is look at trends. So Comparing driver one and driver two, you can see driver one has more understeer than driver two up until lap 40, uh, but then the, the understeer reduces quite significantly for driver one um, from the period between lap 40 and lap 70. Um, so that's an important trend to be able to try and pick out. What's also good having a compare between another car is that you can see that at the same time as the oversteer is getting worse on driver one, it's also getting worse with driver two. You know, if I was the engineer on driver one and just seeing my own data, I'd be 
you know, starting to panic saying, you know, what is it we're doing with the car? What is the driver doing that's making me go towards more oversteer? But actually seeing the other car go in a similar direction, oh, maybe it's not the car, maybe it's not the driver, it's actually the ambient conditions that are making us go in that direction. So it allows you to start, you know, debugging a problem um, with a bit more um, knowledge. The other thing that metrics are good at, uh, good for a uh, highlight, particularly interesting data to look at. So for instance, here, lap 76, you know, it's the, by far the most oversteer lap for driver one. It might be that if we're trying to figure out what's happening in this oversteer um, or this, this trend towards oversteer, this might be the best lap to look at to give us the most extreme examples of what's happening with the car. Uh, so it can highlight, you know, specific data we want to look at. The other thing um, we uh, use are things called events. Uh, so what we use, uh, uh, what events are, they run in the background and they are used to either alert a human operator of some condition being met, uh, which may require some sort of intervention, um, or they can also be used to automate control responses for situations where human intervention would uh, potentially be too slow. An example may be uh, oil pressure drop in an engine. You want to be able to turn it off or change it to a different mode immediately uh, to avoid damage. Um, what we can use events for is to automate that response. And I know this is very close to uh, what SRE do. SRE do is you know, trying to automate everything. Uh, this is kind of what we're trying to do here as well. So any decision that you may want to automate based on the channel or function limits can be written into an event. The above one I show here is just a minor switch change on the steering wheel, um, but we can have you know, safety critical systems which have events set up that can create pop-up alerts for operators to take action autonomous uh, and also take action autonomously. Um, so that was uh, very quickly through kind of how we use data in race engineering. And I'm just gonna look at kind of the data life cycle and a comparison to the SRE philosophy. Um, so I think the things that are very similar uh, between what we do in motorsport and, and what you do, is we're using data to improve uh, system performance and reliability. There's a big push to try and automate analysis as much as possible, um, just purely due to you know, limited time and also human capacity for a given data volume. And it also frees up humans to look at um, more interesting things and look in, in, in greater detail. And monitoring tasks are split along similar lines. In our case, the customer is a driver and the product is a car, but I think there's quite a similar split as shown here. So from monitoring, we've got alerts, which anticipate failure, extract performance. Uh, we've got tickets, which is a more in-depth analysis and ongoing development. Uh, we've also got logging where we can perform root cause analysis and subsequent automation of that. And all of these things feed, feed into proactive fixes, which for us, it's customer feedback. And particularly for me in my role is, you know, the driver's not driving the car well, um, or product improvement. We need to change the setup. We need to change the design. So in conclusion, um, we went through the monitoring structure and the similarities, so alerts where there need to be immediate action, tickets, longer term analysis tasks, and logging where there's root cause analysis and subsequent automation to feed back into our standard processes. And we looked at how in race engineering, we try and visualize data and prioritize data to make the best decisions at the right time. So that is using raw telemetry with pattern recognition and overlays and uh, metrics which are used to highlight trends and try and highlight the most relevant data to investigate uh, and also events uh, to automate analysis and decisions. Um, thank you for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. Hey, thank you, Andrew. Um, amazing. Actually, uh, there's already questions coming in. So I thought maybe to get started, why don't we uh, Let's ask some of those that are coming through the chat. Can you, you you can pull up the chat if you want to just look it up yourself. Actually, I'll yeah, read them for the for the um, for posterity here. Uh, so, so a comment from Michael. That's fascinating. There's a very visible cost in terms of added weight to adding monitoring. If you want to respond to that, it's. Yeah, I mean, uh, for every 10 kilos on a race car, it's roughly around three tenths. So you definitely don't want to be carrying, um, you know, sensors around that aren't giving you an opportunity to go quicker. Essentially, you know, our metric is lap time. We want to go quicker. There's no reason to carry weight. Um, you know, there is a weight limit on cars, but you don't necessarily want to waste it on sensors because you can't put them on the car necessarily where you want it. You want to run your CFG as low as possible for performance. So you might actually take a sensor off so you can run more weight in the, in the ballast in order to bring your CFG down. So there's definitely, um, you know, weight trades being made, even if you if the car is underweight. Are you building these systems from start to finish? I think, uh, meaning uh, this all homegrown technology, what different roles are on your team? 
Um, so the systems that we use in McLaren, so a lot of it is based on uh, McLaren technology. We actually provide uh, logging systems to other teams uh, and all the systems um, kind of software to uh, other teams on the grid. Uh, they were developed um, over many, many years. Uh, the logging system we use is called Atlas. Um, you know, we use System Monitor, which all the F F1 teams use. Uh, different roles on the team. So in, in terms of race engineering, we have, uh, it's kind of split between uh, the systems engineer, or for each car, I should say, there's a systems engineer, which is, uh, they're basically there to, to make sure the car runs. Um, you know, any sensors, any control systems that need to, to run properly, um, they're in charge of that. We then have the performance engineer, which is what I was, I was um, when I was in Formula One, and we're very much looking at the driver and trying to extract the most out of the car. Um, in terms of lap time and then the race engineer who runs the car um, he's he's the one that defines the setup of the car and kind of runs things from the garage perspective so he's the one that kind of owns um, owns the car and um, runs things from uh, from the garage perspective so you kind of already talked I'm going to skip over the ones that are more like comments we can go to the real questions here uh, you talked a little bit about the trade-offs of logging already let's see during incidents um, you know, during a race in your world, right? You're actively looking at this. The speed of this data being ingested and analyzed is often part of the headache. It's always easier in hindsight. Are you able to leverage all this data in real time or do you find it more useful post-session? I think you talked about this a little bit, but maybe you can share yes. a little about that. No, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, so yeah, during incidents, you know, it depends what the incident is. Um, like if it's something that's very easy, easily catchable, uh, like a puncture, or something, then you know we have we have automated alerts to try and and, and highlight that. Um, in terms of the details of you know we lost that half tenth because you braked a little late. Um, you know you were doing that every lap during the race. That's super super difficult to do live. Um, you can do it, um, but it's it's a little bit more involved, and sometimes that kind of insight comes after the race. So live what we try we're basically firefighting we're trying to make sure that we're not losing big chunks of time and making sure that the car is is operating at its peak performance when we come out of session it's more like okay well let's take the data and uh kind of build on what we know uh, know live uh, and look in more detail and try and make sure that we're not missing anything um using things like metrics for instance so heard, uh, i would say yeah, after i would say you, you can't leverage all the data live it's definitely it's definitely like two types of analysis live is i don't want to say firefighting because that's that makes it sound stressful it's not necessarily it's not stressful it's just making sure you're, you're doing the best job you can at the time um, whereas post-session there's definitely more opportunity to look at far more data and make the best decision kind of triaging so kurt anderson and nice to see you kurt he asks uh have there been any significant shifts over time in the approach that your teams use for the data collection analysis significant I mean, shifts over time yeah it's changing all the time in like how we try and use um, how we how we analyze the data in terms of collection. You know, the more sensors you have on the car, the, the more complex the car becomes, the more sensors you need on the car to try and figure out you know whether you're getting the the, the, the best performance. So for sure, over the years, the cars are becoming more complex. The amount of data that you need becomes um, greater, and therefore your analysis has to kind of keep up with that. Um, so for sure, there's definitely been. You know, even now, you know, there's, there's ever increasing amounts of people involved and, um, you know, analysis tasks to, to, to do. All right, I'm going to take one more question, I think, just in the interest of time. Uh, it, how is the sensor data validated? Do you have redundant sensors? Is inaccurate data often an issue? Yeah, so in like safety or in performance critical uh, systems, say that the throttle pedal, we do have redundant sensors. So if one fails, uh, we can go to the other one, and if you know both fail, then you've got a problem. So we do have redundancy in that in that uh, sense. Uh, what was the second part of the question? Well, do you do you use those sensors to validate that the data is accurate, or do you ever get sort of bad readings? How do you make sure that the data you're getting is really uh, accurate? Yeah, I mean, um, like you say, you, you use multiple different um, sensors to to tell you similar things. So, say, for instance, we want to look at. Uh, whether an aerodynamic change did what we expected. We're not just looking at the pressure taps, we're also looking at the push rod loads and trying to correlate them and make sure that they both agree with one another. And if they don't agree with another, why not? And then to try and hone in on that one truth. Awesome. 
Uh, any, let's see if there's any others. Okay, maybe this is, maybe this is, uh, well, Carrie was asking, but maybe we can, it sounds like other people are interested in this too. So I think the question is like, what is the real time? Give us a sense, I guess, of what the real time things are that are happening. Um, and, and I think there's also some questions about the architecture, you know, how much is it being processed locally versus leveraging cloud? Like, is it, you know, as you, you mentioned some of this being sent back to HQ. Um, so how, how do you kind of maybe talk a little bit about that, that architecture to the extent that you can, I know it's, uh, it's also a bit sensitive, but. Yeah, um, so I can probably say, uh, you know, the data is streaming off the car real time. Um, you know, we actually get it almost instantaneously in the garage. It's quite annoying because the, or in terms of the TV feed, the TV feed's always behind the data. So you can see something's happening in the data and then you look at the TV to figure out what's, you know, what's happened. Uh, so that can be annoying. Um, but we have that. We have uh, a, sim a simulation model uh, running real time on a separate um on a separate PC, which also then gets uh, fed into the telemetry stream. So we have simulated data also real time. Uh, and then that all, all gets streamed back to the factory. Um, I think depending on where we are in the world, it can be a bit delayed in the factory, but it, it does tend to be close to real time. Uh, in terms of the things that we're looking at real time, uh, for me, it's like I said, anything that's affecting performance of the car, be it tire pressures, wind direction, driver input, you know, brake temperatures, you know, all of these things you, you're trying to monitor real time. There's a lot of systems on the car that can make it go slower or in fact go quicker. Um, and you're just trying to make sure that you're on top of all of those. Well, I'm sure that we can keep asking you questions forever, um, but you know, everybody stick around because uh, I'm going to talk a little bit and then about some things with the, the meetup. We're going to do a breakout at the end and I, I know Andrew will be around. Um, maybe we can take some more questions or you can maybe get lucky and be in his breakout room and hang out with him. So cool. Yeah. Thank you everybody for listening. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, all right. Thank you. Talk. That was uh, great. That was really great. This is a hard act to follow. Um, <laughs> so folks, this is our, this is our last meetup of the year. I know there's a lot of new faces here and I, uh, I'm really happy that we had so many, um, uh, new folks coming in and, and so many, uh, people interested in, in this talk. I was very excited that we got uh, uh, got Andrew to, to come and share with us a little bit about what they're doing. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about this meetup itself. So this is kind of a, a little bit of a meta talk, if you will. The meta is very timely right now. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about the history, where we are as the in the meetup and where we're going in the future. We just had our uh, kind of end of year planning session uh, for the meetup for 2022. And I wanted to share some really, I think, exciting things about it. But before I do that, uh, there's a go to the next slide, please. I wanted to just take a little bit of a walk down memory lane. And I, I, uh, I asked Urza to pull some pictures together from some of the things we've had in the past. And just, you know, we, we had such a great time in our one in-person meetup we ever got to have, which was in uh, January of 2020, just before the pandemic started. And actually our second meetup uh, was supposed to be hosted at Getty uh, Images where Jolene, we, which we mentioned earlier, I uh, was going to host it in person. We thought, oh, well, you know, we got to delay a couple of weeks while we wait for the you know, pandemic to be over. Um, and that that forced us to really change uh, how we're doing things. And then, you know, later on, we we launched this event called SlowConf, which I think some, I don't know if some of you went to SlowConf, but uh, really a uh, an exciting online event we got to host. And it came out of a, a joke tweet that I did and, the, you know, people wouldn't let me not run the event. So it was kind of this really amazing thing that came out of nowhere. And um the two are intertwined. I don't know if everybody kind of realizes how much the S3 meetup and the slow comp are actually kind of, you know, one and the same. A lot of the same people are involved. A lot of the same topics are involved. And um, as we've been talking to more and more people about the direction, it's kind of made us realize that, you know, that connection makes a lot of sense. Um, anyway, go to the next slide, Urza. Yeah, just the brief history. I kind of talked to this, but the brief history, right? So we started in January 2020, which feels like eons ago, and we were in in the uh, Fremont office, or not the Fremont, in the South Lake Union office in Seattle. We actually started this as the Seattle uh, SRE meetup, and then later on we moved it online, and then we had so many people from all over the world who joined it. We decided to call it Beyond Seattle as a kind of a cute joke, um, and then after that we renamed it just to SRE meetup because you know we didn't want to have so many qualifiers on it. Um, we added a you know new planning committee. You saw the people who are involved in planning this. This isn't something that I'm doing alone or that Urza is doing alone. It's something that we're doing as a team. Um, you know, we have so many people involved in, in making the event so special and finding speakers and, and really making it interesting for the group. 
and uh, and all the things that happen too in the Slack. You know, there's you know, I think there was a somebody who mentioned there's a student here. We do um, uh, office hours. Zach leads office hours for um, for students. We do a lot of uh, uh, kind of diversity work and inclusion work with people. We'll try to help them get into the tech industry. We do a lot with uh, helping people with recruiting. So we really have developed a lot of uh, cool programs uh, off to the side. And what we want to do is get more people involved. So I want to make a, a little bit of an announcement. Go to the next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Oh, by the numbers. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I forgot my own presentation. I, I had to add data into it because we had Andrew here, so I had to show that we had data. But it's kind of crazy, right? We started from zero. We now have uh, 916 members, apparently. We've been running for 19 months. 739 people in the Slack. By the way, if you're not in the Slack, I highly, highly recommend that you get into the Slack because that's where the action is. And we want to, I want to see even more conversations happening there. The other cool thing about the Slack is it is the SLOCOM um, Slack space as well. So all of the talk tracks are in there and you can see even conversations we had with authors of all the SRE books, right? You can see the uh, discussions that were had by people like Carrie, right? Who was a speaker at SLOCOM and does an amazing uh, intro to SRE uh, talk there. There's some really, uh, uh, really great uh, content that you get access to in the in the Slack that's nowhere else. Um, and you know, all the companies that are here, all the events that we've had over the years, it's it's really amazing that what what this event, what this group has become. And it's even I think a little underrepresented by the people who actually show up to the meetup too, because we have people in so many different time zones that watch the videos after the fact and, and everything. So it's 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 quite cool. Anyway, let's let's go on. So, okay, here's, this is the thing. I wanted to make the big announcement because we're making a big change. And this was, I don't even think it was a controversial change, but one of the things we realized when we talk about SRE is SRE is such a important uh, movement and it's an important job role. Um, it's something that is actually at the same time somewhat limiting because there's so many people who don't identify with the SRE moniker. And what we found from talking to a lot of people in the community is we were actually having people who are resistant to participate because they didn't think they were qualified, right? They didn't think they were senior enough. They didn't think that they were focused on the right job. You know, they, they saw themselves more as either IT ops or software engineering developer, uh, et cetera. But the thing that has unified everybody in this and the thing that really stands out in SRE is service level objectives, SLOs. This is the topic that has been so hot. This is why slow conference was such a uh, amazing event for everybody involved and why it was so important. And what we realized is that SLOs are the unifying factor that make this uh, meetup work. This is the, the topic area because we're all trying to figure out how to measure things in a way that doesn't seek perfection, but seeks excellence. So we decided to rename the uh, the meetup yet again. So here we go. Drum roll, please. Is everybody ready? Guess what the new name is? Here it comes. Slow Conf Monthly. That's the new name of this meetup. So we are no longer the SRE meetup. We are now Slow Conf Monthly. You heard it here first. What do you think? Love it. <laughs> no one cares. All right. Great idea. So, <laughs> great idea, right? Okay, cool. Uh, so what, what does this mean? So the name is one part, and I think this unifies, I think, a lot of things about this group. And by the way, there's a bunch of people who have been involved in SlowConf. They don't really hang out on the SRE meetup. I think now SlowConf Monthly, they'll be very excited to be part of that, and you, you know who some of those people are. Well, this opens up a new door for us. So go to the next slide, Erza. It also saves us from having a second Twitter account. So that really is the real reason behind it. No, I'm just joking. So, so the first thing is we're, we're rechartering ourselves, right? And we're actually gonna write up a charter. So the planning committee got together and some people stepped down, some people uh, you know, are, you know, signed on for more, but basically we're gonna come up with a, a very clear charter and we wanna do this in a very transparent and open way. So that, that's gonna be one of the first things is to really define what is this group about and how does it work? We still want to have SRE topics, right? SRE and SLO are, are deeply entwined, as many of you know, and we want to continue to have those kinds of talks. And we want to expand it to have people like, you know, uh, like Andrew, for example, who doesn't identify at all as an SRE, but has amazing things to say about liability of systems and using data to make better decisions and separating real time versus delayed decisions. All this stuff is really interesting to this group of people, and it can come from all kinds of different areas. And this is really what we're trying to do. And uh, uh, that's I mean, this, this idea of being maximally inclusive. This is the term that we've kind of settled on in the planning committee. I think it's good you're going to see it in our charter. Being maximally inclusive is part of our goal. And so, you know, you can't just have it be a free for all. We got to be about something. So we found something that I think everybody in our group really believed in. And I think it was a very thoughtful conversation had with, you know, uh, you know, our, our folks like Dylan and staff and others have been all weighed in on their, their opinions on this stuff as we made this, uh, this decision. Okay, so next slide, please. There's a big opportunity for everyone to get involved. And this I think is the most exciting thing coming out of this. So I, I talked about SlowConf, 
monthly. Well, the other thing we're developing, we're, we're going to be launching is local chapters. Okay. We have been, and Zach, Zach and I in particular, but a bunch of us, I know Erza as well, have talked to so many people who are figuring out how to get back into the world, right? We love the fact that, that being online gives us access to each other and we can have people come together. But we also know that meeting up in person is a completely different experience, okay? And we have people in all sorts of great places. And we've already kind of started talking to folks who've come to us proactively and said, look, I wanna build, I wanna build on this meetup. They thought it was the SRE meetup, but now it's the SlowConf meetup. Or they said, I wanna be part of SlowConf and I wanna help it happen in the city. So we already have uh, identified nominees for our, uh, beginning chapters in Austin, Lisbon, New York, um, and then India and Africa, which are obviously not cities, but are uh, you know places that have uh, pockets of uh, you know SLO focused folks or SRE folks, um, and we want to get those established. What will it mean? It means that those groups can figure it out for themselves. Okay. So now that adds a leadership structure, okay? This is the next piece is there's roles and there's a, a little bit more structure we need to make this thing run. It can't just be Urza, uh, you know, chasing everybody down. We wanna create more of a team structure, okay? So we have the central planning committee, which is, by the way, I make it sound like very highfalutin. It's really pretty easy. You join a Slack channel, you come to occasional meetings. We make, you know, you know, figure out how to make this thing better. You know, we wanna establish a formal speakers committee, you know, really make sure that we're thinking and planning ahead so we're not scrambling for speakers and that we maintain some of the things we love about this meetup that we try to, I don't know if everybody's noticed, but we try to balance a technical speaker with a non-technical speaker, a male speaker with a female speaker. We try to make sure that we've got different ideas for people coming in at the 101 level or the 401 level. You know what I'm saying? It's something that we really take seriously. And now we're gonna see more opportunity for events. We, we had to figure out how we can use um, sponsorship money and handle handle finances. We want to have local captains in each of these uh, areas that can take charge, build the local community, and then still bring it together. Um, you, we have launched a nomination form. Ur Urza added the nomination questions to the um, to the uh, survey. We're going to pass this around in the meetup um, Slack space as well. And definitely, first of all, give us feedback. Um, everybody, we always whether you're nominating or not, please fill out the form. Um, so that you can get, um, you can get, um, you know, involved. And I see people saying they love the slow comp. Awesome. Okay. Thanks for not. Um, so you want, you can nominate yourself. In fact, we highly encourage you to nominate yourself. You know, if you want to not, everybody should nominate Zach, obviously, because Zach does it all, but you want to think about what role you can play with time commitment, be part of shaping this. And the reason why we're unveiling this now is we haven't actually built any of the nomination process or anything else. We want people who are nominating to like get involved in how we do this. And then we're going to have the rules of the road for how, um, how this, this governance, right, works in this thing. So it's transparent, it's fair, it's open for everybody. There's no power grabs, there's no vendor party. We maintain our number one rule, which is no sales pitch, right? We, we can maintain all of that and formalize it in a way that really lets this group um, build, turn it into what they want it to be. Um, we're always looking for speakers. And hey, I Kit, Kit, let, let, me, let me butt in. So just to, to echo Please. Kit's point there, uh, that we have officially decided to kick Kit out of, the nominating uh, part for our local chapters, right? Because we want this to truly be, you know, a fair and democratic uh, way to do it. So we've decided to make a big show and say, Kit, you can't nominate anybody and you can't make any decisions about who winds up in a leadership position. Uh, so we are kicking you out. Well, and if you get... Thank you, Zach. I know. And if you guys know me, you know, I'm a kind of a control freak. So uh, it's a little bit, you know, I'm letting go a little bit, you know, they started this group from nothing started slow comp from nothing. And I don't, I mean, Danny's here, I think too. And Urza's here. I mean, they put on an amazing event with slow comp, just an absolutely outstanding event. So many people involved in it, but you know, I still get to take some of the credit. Now I'm, I'm trying to take a, a, a more outside role here and let the thing form for itself. And let's see where it goes. Let's see what happens. I think it's, it's a really exciting for me to watch this happen and hopefully the, you know they'll find something for me to do. Um, we are we are going to be also starting to talk about slow comp 2022 as part of this planning process, right? So now we've got this monthly rhythm, we've got the slack space, we're going to have the local chapters, then the question becomes well what does slow comp 2022 look like? And I've been scratching my head on this one a lot and a lot of people have. We've tried a few different ideas um, to make uh, to make it really sing for people. We all know the challenges of online and that's why slow comp was special. We also know the challenges of going back. Um, we know we don't want to lose the in-person opportunity for the people who can do it safely. Um, this is something we need to figure out. I wish I had an answer. I don't. And the reason uh, we don't is because the community hasn't formed around this yet. And now we're going to form that community and you get to own it. That is to me the most exciting part of what is happening with slow comp. And now this is really 
one thing unified um, that I'm personally just extremely excited about. Okay. Do I have any more slides? Is that it, Rizzo? I don't remember. So I think one, one of the, hey, so Kit, I think it's really awesome to say that what made SlowConf great are all the people, right? Like we had an amazing group of people come together and do presentations and speak. A wonderful group of people participating, asking great kept questions and interacting with each other. And we've seen that happen every month with our meetup group, right? Like we see people come together, they ask great questions. We have a ton of fun in our breakout rooms. Uh, I've met so many wonderful people all across the world through this meetup that it's just, it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, and we want to keep that going. And we also want to empower every single person that comes into the meetup, right? And so if you want to take this and turn it into something special for your area, we want to give you the tools and the backing that you need to be able to do that. Um, you know, and there's no telling what, what can happen with this. Um, like Kit said, SlowConf was originally a, a stupid joke on Twitter. Right. Uh, Kit made a joke because I was talking trash about, you know, a tool. And he was like, oh, we should have a conference to talk about this so you can say it in person. And bam, we had SoCon. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. you know, it, it's been a phenomenal journey. And I think it's going to be amazing. We've had a lot of really awesome interest uh, in places that I would have never thought that I find myself making really dear friends. Uh, yeah. And so I think it's, I think it's wonderful. And I really encourage everybody, you know, even if you only have a slight inclination to be involved, get involved with